Welcome, everyone. Keaton, thanks for joining us via video. Uh, we have a great cast here today. This is February 2018. It's the 21st of February, and Bill is here to give us a great Q&A session. Uh, okay. we, we had one, uh, one question on the Facebook group, but I want to uh, open up the uh, questioning to any of the attendees. Bill, do you have any opening remarks? I have none. All right. How about uh, any any newbies? Maybe Keaton, maybe Ban H, maybe XYZ. Any of you guys? XYZ, that's awesome. No, nothing? Brian Chung had to find his earbuds. He's late, but he's on his way. So if you egg him on, he'll probably respond now. Yeah. Uh, Steven, why don't you... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you start us off? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, I, I was wondering about how you kind of group your upper extremity tests paired with infrasternal angle measures. So I, I, I have a specific example if that would help. Why don't, um, you, why don't you do that? It, it's just much easier to speak from an example, like a case study kind of thing. So, uh, so, so two patients both have wide infrasternal angles. Um, Neither is limited in flexion or external rotation of the shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, both are limited in internal rotation of the shoulder, mm -hmm. but only one is limited in horizontal abduction. I guess, mm -hmm. what's your, how do you interpret those tests and how would it change your treatment strategy following um, the, the, those test results? Sure. This is, this, the, part of this is really, really easy, and then the other part's probably going to be a little complicated. Um, <clears throat> so let's take, let's, let's consider, um, how they're being measured for a moment. Okay. If, if I have a wide infrasternal angle, that means I have a compensatory strategy of, of inhaling against an exhaled axial skeleton. And so I, I could have a number of other compensations that are superimposed on the infrasternal angle compensatory component. One of those compensations is actually tipping the whole thorax posteriorly. So, and and when I when I talk about not not the whole thorax rather, but but the uh, uh, the uh, vertebral sternal thorax. So the so the the vertebra, the ribs, and the sternum that are that are attached will move as a single segment in a compensatory strategy, which would tip it posteriorly. Okay. So, so think of tipping the pelvis into a posterior tilt. Now we're going to do the exact same thing with the uh, upper thorax. So uh, does your guy that has full, uh, full flexion and external rotation and limited internal, or they, they both have limited internal rotation, correct? Yeah. Okay. The one that has the limited bilateral horizontal abduction, does he have an up? pump handle um yes okay so that's not a real up pump handle that is the compensatory position of the upper thorax so what happens is the upper thorax will tilt posteriorly okay and so the flexion measure that you've got is not even full flexion because if you think about a compensatory strategy of extension somewhere in the general vicinity of the thoracolumbar junction and I tip the thorax back, and then you're, you're hitting the table, which looks like it's full flexion, but it's not really full flexion. And then you say, well, he's got full external rotation, but now you've got a compensatory strategy of the scapula, which is posteriorly tilted, and that allows that full external rotation to actually appear. And, and, and then you have the limited horizontal, <clears throat> which he shouldn't have any right as far as the limitation goes um, if i have that compensatory strategy <clears throat> where i'm driving extension bilaterally i would be able to horizontally abduct okay mm -hmm. now let's talk about the guy that has the one side that that abducts and the other side doesn't so now you got a twist so instead of having a bilateral extension pattern um, up in the thorax, I mainly use a one-sided strategy. So, so you still have to address the limitation 
in horizontal abduction as you would with any other rotational limitation. But when you have a wide infrastructural angle like that, and you have all these symmetrical measures, you probably do have some measure of compensatory strategy of just the upper thorax tilting backwards. Now, does that make sense when I say tilting the upper thorax backwards? Um, yeah, you know, that's kind of what they look like, you know, like a ski jumper, you know, like one of those long ski jumpers kind of leaning back. Um, yeah. So let me draw it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to make some sort of imaginary first rib and an imaginary sternum and an imaginary thorax. So, so this is sternum and this is dorsal rostral thorax. So it's the upper back. And so I have a fixed distance here. And I'm just going to say that this is 10 somethings. Okay, that's the, the distance, so we, so we know what that is. So what you might actually have <clears throat> is a thorax that simply reorients. So if, it, if everything tilts back together, this distance doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. But, but here's, here's the interesting little twist of fate. This, is, this strategy actually reduces the, the pressure in the upper thorax ever so slightly. So it is an inhalation strategy. So you have an in, a compensatory inhalation that makes a wide infrasternal angle, and then you have an upper thorax strategy that is trying to drive further inhalation. But in doing so, they use the compensatory strategy of um, posterior tilting the scapula, externally rotating the scapula, and adducting the scapula. And that's why you lose your horizontal abduction. So what that would look like, hang, hang on, I'm gonna switch colors here. Oops. So, so his scaps are resting in that position there. So that's that's an ER scap. It's adducted towards the spine and it's posteriorly tilted. And so, you know, it, and this is an exaggeration, obviously. So if my shoulder joint is there, my pec would have to go like way around here. So I would lose I would lose horizontal ab abduction because I'm just out of room. I don't have any more length in the in the pecs um, from which to to work from. So there's there's the rest of the humerus, okay? So that's what you're looking at. But if I superimpose a small rotation on top of that, where I get a little bit of a twist, even though the measures are, are essentially symmetrical, you've got a little bit of a twist there that allows one of them to go. And so you have one scap. Which which side drops, Stephen? Um, for, for this particular patient, it was it was. Uh, she she had uh, horizontal abduction on both sides, but I, I've been I, I've seen some people to where say their left side doesn't drop. Right. Okay. So so what happens if if so if you get a little bit of an internal rotation? So, uh, so I'm going to draw this in blue. So if I have a scap that goes in that direction to any degree, that's where I pick up the horizontal. But the only reason that 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 scap would be in that position is because it's trying to follow the thorax. So you do have a little bit of a rotation there, but you may have enough um, symmetrical muscle activity in, uh, in regards to the, the sternal position that um, you're, you're still not going to have um, like the full IR kind of thing show up. Okay. Okay. Does that help? Um, yes. Yes. Um, what if, how does that change if they have a narrow infrasternal angle and they still, it, but they don't have horizontal abduction? Okay. So um, you can still have a compensatory um, scapular strategy depending on what other compensations that you're, you're dealing with, 
right? So if you think about the, uh, the upper thorax um, starts in an inhaled position for a narrow infrasternal angle, and then the lower thorax is exhaling against it. So if you think about what should be the scapular position uh, under those circumstances, if I'm inhaled, do you know? See, this is a test. I'm, te I'm treating you like a student. Do you know what it should be? With inhalation? Yes, sir. Um, I, I would think it would be the scapular adduction external rotation that you uh, talked about on the, just previously. So, so when I inhale, I get a posterior tip of the scap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I inflate the dorsal rostral. So, so the, the, uh, airflow goes back that way. Okay. And so that tips the scap posteriorly. And then I have an expansion of that area, which separates the scapula. Right? Mm. Right? So far, so good? I, I think so. So, so. so, so this, this should expand, right? So again, it's going to tilt it back, right? And then I have a little bit of an ER scap. Because even though, even though the bucket handle concept tends to be associated with the lower rib cage, the upper ribs also bucket handle. And so I'm going to have a scap that looks something like that. So the degree with which the, the scapula will externally rotate would be associated with how much horizontal abduction I have. So if they have more, say, say they typically maintain a position of increased scapular adduction, you would expect to see de deficits in uh, horizontal abduction because the, the shoulder blades already retracted pecs on stretch. Right. So any, any movement that does that or that, right, mm -hmm. makes the scap turn this away and that steals your horizontal gotcha okay is the ir limitation then is that just um increased scapular protraction while they're laying on the table it is not no <laughs> it can be associated with that but what i what i would what i would try to associate the internal rotation uh, measure um, as far as like trying to come up with some sort of correlation mm -hmm. is that right there. And that would be your pump okay. handle. That would be your pump handle. Oh, so if, if pump handles down, you would expect deficits in IR and if it's up, then you would expect them to have IR. Is that what you're saying? That is my expectation, young man. Okay. okay. Yep. So if I have a twisted sternum, so hang on. Let me. So if I have a sternum, let's just keep sternum green. If I have a sternum that looks like that, wait a minute, wait for it. If I have a sternum that looks like that, and I'm, I'm exaggerating the size of the sternum. Mm -hmm. So if the sternum is twisted, so it's right facing, what I would suggest you consider this is a pump handle that is up on the left and down on the right. Okay. Okay. And that way, that way it becomes a nice little consistent measure. So if I flip flop that, if I flip flop the sternum, so now I have a sternum that goes this away, that is a pump handle up on the right, down on the left. And guess what happens? You get a flip flop of internal rotation of the shoulders. Cool. Okay. Oh, that helps a lot. Um, cool. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. But what, so what this does is it, is it simplifies the entire process. You don't have to come up with, with funny names for things um, or, or conditions or, or make something special about that. You just identify it by the constraints of the system, period. <clears throat> and then it's just a matter of 
understand what the normal mechanics are, the, the easiest way to compensate from those normal mechanics, and then you have to layer on compensatory activity. So let me give you, for instance, about today. So we had a guy that came in um, that, that was about 130 degrees wide. Okay. That's really wide. Yeah, it is. Okay. And so, so very, 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 very inflated. So he had a compensatory exhalation strategy, a compensatory, another compensatory inhalation strategy, and then a compensatory adaptation stacked on top of this. And, but the cool thing about it is, is if you, if you just do it like one constraint at a time and you identify so for instance, like his compensatory exhalation strategy, just so you understand what I'm talking about, is he bent his sternum downward into the pump handle. So where the manubrium meets the sternum, there's a synchondrosis, right? Where, right where the second rib meets it. And so what he did is he bent the, the pump handle down and kept the manubrium in an inhalation position. That's how he exhaled on top of an inhalation strategy. And, and so... It, but his measures followed the sternum and, and they always appear to do, to do that until I, till I'm convinced otherwise that's what I'll express. And I, I, I'm willing to be totally wrong in this regard because I haven't seen anything from a research perspective that says, Hey, you know what happens when you bend a sternum down, um, you lose internal rotation of your shoulder. I just haven't seen it. And, and nor have I seen anything associated with that. And I've, I've seen some stuff where they, they do show that it, that there's a flexibility there, but, but certainly never associated with any peripheral measure. So, Very cool. so, so take it with a grain of salt, make a note of it and then observe and feel free to contradict me at any time and come back um, to me on, with any information in that regard. Cause I would appreciate it because I'm trying to destroy my own thought processes at this point. Cool. Cool. Eric Manis looks bored. No. Was that exciting for you? It was exciting for me. How you doing, brother? I'm well. Okay, good. I'm glad. <laughs> All right. Somebody step up to the plate. Oh, there's everybody. Hi, Brian. I see your handsome face, you devil, you. Are you going to complain about me using my whiteboard instead of the uh, good notes? No? Okay. I got a bunch of interns sitting in the purple room right now, and nobody's asking a question. Can you believe that? It's like they have this opportunity, and they're all chicken. Tim's, Tim's quickly looking through his notebook to come up with something. Nobody has a question? Campo, how's school? How's school? Yeah. Um, just finished a practical on ultrasounds, so that was fun. You know what the uh, maximum number of ultrasounds that is allowed before you can determine whether it's effective or not? The maximum number? Yeah, maximum number. I actually pulled this from a journal once, so I can remember it very, very clearly. Hit me with it. 14. You have to do ultrasound 14 times until you can. Apparently so. It was in, it was in one journal article. I just thought it was the funniest thing, and so that thing is just stuck in my head. Okay. I wonder if it's 14 with the the machine on, though. <laughs> That's always my question. Yeah. Anything else going, Keaton? Where are you from, buddy? Uh, St. Louis. St. Louis. You're only like four hours away, dude. Why aren't you coming to visit? I'm actually from Peru. Uh, Indiana. I moved here. I went Peru, to Indiana. Yes, sir. Do you know Mark Middleton? Can't say that I do. How about Tim Klein? Yes. They, they used to own the TV and appliance store there. Can yeah. You that? yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. See. Yeah. I know. He lives in the Cole Porter mansion. That's how I know that. Gotcha. Yeah. Am I correct? Tim and Cindy. Uh, His wife Cindy. Cindy? Klein. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Does he still wear a toupee? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. All right. He's he's actually a very good human. So I've mm -hmm. actually met him. So good guy. Come on. Like go go ahead. Um, the DRT, or you call it the dorsal rostral thorax. Dorsal rostral thorax. What um, spinal level does that stop at? 
Uh, that would be, so, so take your sternal area on the front side and just mirror it on the back side. Well, it's a very cool area, actually, and when you get right down to it. Is that, is that just including like true ribs? Is that including? Yeah, ribs? yeah, just yeah. So, so figure like, like T1 to T7. Seven. Okay. Yeah, um, with the associated ribs. But so, so the important part of the, the dorsal rostral aspect, though, is the fact that you've got inspiratory intercostals there. And, and so that area needs to expand. And, and so that area mirrors all other kyphoses. Only in that area? What do you mean? What do you mean like only? You only have area? inspiratory intercostals only in that area? Uh, it's predominantly inspiratory intercostals. So inspiratory intercostals tend to be predominant around the sternum, so the parasternal area, and then the dorsal rostral area. If, if you start from the, the first rib on down, the lower you go, the less inspiratory the intercostals are, the wider you go. So laterally speaking, uh, um, they are lesser uh, of inspiratory intercostals and they become more expiratory. So, and, and now for your test that they're going to ask you for, always remember that the externals are in, inspiratory and the internals are expiratory because that's Hamburger's uh, reference of, of him doing it via... Um, like the fiber direction and stuff like that. Whereas I think it was Detroyer that, that uh, looked at the intercostals from a, a, uh, a neurophysiological perspective. So like they, they, they're, they're compartmentalized in regards to neural drive, um, much like the uh, obliques are. What do you mean by compartmentalized? So like on, so, an, in, on an inspiration, the internals will... Um, kick on is that essentially in certain in certain areas so, so again it, it's it's just compartmentalized so like so this the parasternal area tends to be more inspiratory intercostals regardless of the fiber direction so so if you think about intercostals in in the axilla area they're going to be less inspiratory than than the ones closer to the to the sternum and the, the way that i always make that association is i i've got a pump handle on the sternum it's like okay what's what's going to allow that area to expand so i can create this pump handle action and so it, that's how i remember that those those intercostals are primary inspiratory and then the easy part is just okay it's mirrored on the back side so if i take a breath in i get this anterior posterior uh expansion um, between the sternum and the dorsal rostral area. So it's very easy to manage. The other cool thing about this is, is because I've got the true ribs that are connecting this area, this whole area can, can perform as a single girdle under certain circumstances. And so when I talk about uh, compensatory activities, they will actually sort of lock together and, and move at the same time within the same pattern. So that's how you identify compensatory uh, um, strategies. So you're saying compensatory is when this entire area is moving with itself rather than you're saying, uh, it, you, you gotta be really clear on what you mean by that because, um, it, as, as the sternum goes into its pump handle and the dorsal rostra expands, they are moving simultaneously. They're moving in, in expansion. But if, if they're both moving in the same direction, then you probably have a compensatory strategy. Is that, is that DRT supposed to be moving out and up? Like it's doing its own pump handle along with the sternum? Well, but it, okay, it, I tell you, I, so let me, let me draw what, what, what we're talking about. Is that okay? So I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw this area like a relatively flat spine. So we're just going to call that the dorsal rostral uh, area there in the upper back. And then I, are we, are we, sorry, are we okay. considering these people narrow or wide or this can be put? I don't care. We're talking about normal mechanics here. Okay. Okay. And then I got a sternum on the front side. Okay. So, so when I take a breath in and I drive air in, right? Air goes in. Then, then, so the, the, whole upper thorax has to expand, right? So I'm gonna have air pushing front and back. So my pump handle goes up and then this goes back. So what this looks like, because I have the constraint of the first rib, the, the uh, spine will have to look differently, right? So the spine will now do this, oops. You gotta learn how to use this thing. Here we go. 
So it's going to be kyphotic, right? Because I've got constraints that limit what it can do. So if this area wasn't attached to the first rib up here, the whole thing would tilt backwards. Okay. So now Stephen Laflame is is figuring this out in his head as I before I even say it. By God, Bill, that looks just like a sacrum if if the whole thing was fused and tilted back on inhalation. And he's right. So this dorsal rostral area, as it becomes kyphosed on expansion during inspiration, it's actually tilting backwards. It's it, if you could if you, if it was a sacrum, it would be counternutating on inhalation. So this area mirrors the sacrum. Um, I'm not familiar with the sacrum in inhalation. Can you kind of go over that for me, please? I can. Thank you. You know where the sacrum is, right, Kempo? I've seen it in one or two books before, yeah. Okay, good. I kind of figured. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw like a really, really simple kind of thing here, okay? Spine. Yes. Cool. And sacrum. All right. So, so we're going to call this some sort of mid range imaginary position that we can never measure, but that's where we're starting from. So this is halfway between an, a full inhale and a full exhale. So as I breathe in, the sacrum counter nutates, so it tips backwards. And it also brings the lumbar spine back to reduce the lordosis. That's an inhale. I also get expansion of the posterior upper thorax, the dorsal rostral thorax, which kyphosis. It expands. It gets bigger. So again, if I, if I didn't have a first rib, this area would come back too, and so they look just the same. But this provides you a, a, a model of how the axial skeleton should move during respiration because we use that as the, a foundation of measurement in regards to how we move pressures inside the body. And if we can identify where those pressures are and where they may be limited, we then identify socket position based on those positions. And then that determines how our appendicular movement is limited. Does that give you a point of reference? Hello, campus. Yes, yes, okay. it does. Um, does. Was there? Do you have another question off of that? Yeah. So now I'm just trying to put the pieces of this into um, what you were talking about before with the wide infrasternal angle and how the entire thing posteriorly tilts. Uh huh. Um, and then I had another question off of that where you were showing how the entire volume of the thorax doesn't change. It's just posteriorly tilting. Right. Um, this might be, um, this might have to do with it or not, but if there's no volume change, wouldn't there be no air coming in? So it's a very, very small volume change and to do, but, but the, the way I want to describe it from a model standpoint is that it's not like an expansion of the, of the thorax, it's the posterior tilt. And then you have to look at the relationship in regards to, to um, where everything attaches on the inside in regards to like diaphragm position and such that, that there is a, 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 an increase in volume, which creates a little bit of a negative pressure, but it's, it's not like an ideal strategy on any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's very strongly compensatory, but the area that's moving, it, if, if you look at it from the perspective that, that the relationships are not changing, you can see it as the compensatory strategy and then why you have a visual representation of what you do and then the measurements associated with that. Um, because if, if you try to do it strictly visually, you always screw it up. Right. Okay. Um, does, that, does that make sense? I, ju I just don't want you to think that it's a volume change because the minute you start thinking, well, it's expansion, it's like, that's what we're supposed to do. And, and it's, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a, a um, I call it a fake pump handle is what it is. When, when the whole thing tips back, it does create a little bit of negative pressure 
but it's a, it's a crappy strategy. It's a very effortful strategy and it requires a tremendous amount of intercostal drive that makes the rib cage very rigid. Gotcha. Okay. Now, can you almost um, divide that into planes where you're not getting the expansion front to back, but maybe because they are wide and for sternal, they're getting it from frontally. You see what I'm saying? No. Try it. Try one more time for me. So you, you talked about how um, it's not expanding back. It's just tilting back. Right. So the, the thorax actually isn't moving in the sagittal plane. It, it's tilting backwards. Right. But not, not in the way that we would want it. No, it's not expanding and allowing air in. No, it, it's 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 literally lifting up the front side and then tipping the bats backside back at the same rate. So if if I did if I drew it very very simply, it's that. Yeah. Okay. So then, okay. So, so if I pull, if I pull back hard enough, right, I can, I can spread the, so based on where everything attaches down low, I'll have, I'll eventually bump into a constraint that'll give me a, this, this small amount of expansion, whether it be in an intercostal area or, or getting a, you know, a, a smidgen of movement in the sternum, or, you know, I, I hit the end range of, of an, an ab that that is already in a position um, and near its end range and and that I'll get a little bit of inhalation in that regard because these are the people that are really really hyper inflated mm -hmm. and so they're just trying to stack more air on top of a full lung they're just trying to get that last little bit of air in before they yawn or cough or sigh and that's how they get the air out because they have, they have to create some form of active exhalation on a regular basis otherwise they suffocate okay and these will be your sleep apnea people that have to have like air shoved down their throat to, so they get some sort of rebound that pushes it back out and they get enough uh, airflow at nighttime. Okay. So then I'm, I'm trying to picture in my head where the, the wide angle is coming from here. Cause that, that looks more like a sternum is coming forward and it's creating a narrow angle. It's lifting up and tilting backwards. It's just, if again, you got you have to divide the thorax into into its uh, constraints. There, there there are consistencies within the constraints that you can sort of create a model. And again, this this is my model. This is the way I'm looking at it to simplify this thing. Because if you just look at it as 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 sections that are just stacked on top of each other. One second. So. If I draw this, can you dig it? Mm hmm. Okay. So there you go. So, so these are the, these are how you would divide it up. And, and then you would have the same thing, you know, on a posterior representation. So the constraints up, up high, this is going to be more transverse plane oriented. This is going to be more frontal oriented and this is going to be more sagittal. So now, so these are spinal, these are spinal constraints yeah. as well as the rib cage. Right now, let me let me offer you a caveat. Yes, I am aware that each of these sections can move in all three planes. So, what I'm offering you is that the degrees of freedom, and in, in, as I've described them, are emphasized. And so, again, just simplifying what is available. So, when we do measure things, we know what we're measuring. Right. Um. So then to reiterate, because where I think I was getting confused as well is that you were calling these constraints. So it's not that they're constrained within these planes. 
is that they, they have or they should possess more degrees of freedom in these planes rather than um, – just look at it from an emphasis standpoint. And when I say constraints, it's the design of the, of the joints. So if I'm looking at zygopophyseal joints in the upper thorax, they rotate a little bit more than they side bend. If I look at the, if I look at the lower part of the thorax, um, they side bend a little bit more because the constraints of, of how the ribs are attached to the spine are a little bit different because mm-hmm. I've got bucket handle action that is a little bit more prominent, which occurs in the frontal plane. And then if I look at sagittal plane, you look at the zygopophyseal joints of the lumbar spine, they're primarily sagittal. The sacrum really tends to stay oriented wherever the lumbar spine goes, so that goes with it. So again, you, you just again, it's a simplification of, of, of a massive amount of complexity so you can actually discuss things and then you understand like why you get a measurement like you do. Okay. So then let's go with, within this view now, let's go back to um, wide infrasternal angle sternum tilts backwards mm-hmm. sternum and drt tilt backwards uh-huh in an in inhalation okay then we get an increase in frontal plane activity within that zone below it i'm trying to yep. connect those two dots right there yeah yeah you're right but, so this is this is my my green area here. This is my green area from before. Mm-hmm. Okay. What are you What are you asking now? What are you asking? I'm I'm trying to see in my head how that sagittal plane activity up top mm-hmm. is creating frontal plane activity at the bottom. It's just because that they're moving more within each plane. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that it creates frontal plane lower down. Okay. It doesn't create it. It might, it might promote it because I don't have, uh, uh, I don't have full variability of this upper thorax. So now I have to compensate around it to get air in. So if I have an exhaled axial skeleton from top to bottom, okay, how do I get air in? I have to, I have to, I have to move something that that is capable of moving. So, if I look at the false ribs, they're attached to the sternum via costal cartilages, which are very, very flexible relative to the other costal cartilages. So, if you start from the top, you look at the first costal cartilage; it's very, very small, has a little bit of torque in it, not much else. As I go down the line, down towards the the lower part of the sternum, the costal cartilage is bigger. Now, I have. I have fewer constraints as far as the mobility of those ribs are, are, that are available. If I look at the false ribs, even more availability of movement there. And then you go to the back side, and as you get below like, like T9, where, where now I have ribs at, at, I believe, T10 that are only attached to a single segment, and they're a different shape. Now they move a lot more. So there's my first place where the constraints are loose enough where I can actually compensate against the, the exhaled position of the body of the axial skeleton and I can inhale against it, but I have to do so by physically spreading the, the infrasternal angle because that's the only direction that I can move the ribs as the diaphragm descends because the other constraints are, are, are too rigidly positioned to allow it to happen. Okay. So can you almost, um, is there going to be a predictable, pathway of compensation through this Uh, yes can we i I think there is i think there is can we even like list that out in chronological order or something like that or is that so 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 here's something that you have to keep in mind because we are dealing with with a lot of complexity that can get stacked on top of each other okay right a lot of the a lot of the identification of the actual compensatory strategy doesn't really come to to uh, be recognized until I've actually done something. Okay. So like this. So so to figure out how the the patient this morning was actually compensating and then and then how he created an adaptation, we literally had to go through a series of steps to determine that. As in, just like attempts on repositioning. See what worked, what didn't work. I have no idea what you mean by repositioning. Okay. I don't um, use that word. Changing pressure. How about we restore the, the, the just normal movement? 
can we do just call it that? Sure. So what I want, what I want with the axial skeleton, uh, Campo is, mm -hmm. is I want a full excursion from full inspiration to full expiration. That's my goal. Okay. Period. Period. Once you do that, great things happen. So you attempt to do that. Yes. Through a series of steps. Absolutely. Individualized to that person. Based or, on that, based on, based on their findings. Yes. So, so you take your, your initial measurements that determine where am I in the respiratory spectrum from inhalation to exhalation. Okay. And then what is my, what is my compensatory strategy? Okay. And then that tells me what I should do first. Sure. Okay. So all I, all I need is one test to tell me where I am in, in, in the respiratory excursion. Right, because I know how the I know how the axial skeleton should move in the sagittal plane during inspiration or in, inhalation and exhalation, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just have one test that that gives me that, and then if I know what the constraints of the axial skeleton are, I can pretty much determine where that first compensatory activity is going to take place, and then that gives me my first intervention. Okay. And then what I should see is the appendicular measures that I took initially should change if my intervention is correct. And then it's, then that process is just repeated over and over and over until the entire excursion is restored. And that's all treatment is, right? Right. I think... Is this, I get... fun? is this fun for anybody? <laughs> I, I, g g give me, I, I'm just looking at people's expressions and they're just kind of like dead to the world. So I'm a little worried that I'm, I'm being boring. Are we good? Give me, everybody give me a thumbs up if we're okay. Seriously. Except for Brian. I don't care about Brian. Oh, come on, brother. You know I love you. Lucy. Oh, Lucy doesn't use the screen because she's got to go to sleep tonight. <laughs> Hi, Lucy. I see you there. With, uh, I know we've talked about this previously, but I think it mm -hmm. just made sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just so you know, I, I've actually learned a few things this week. So. so the thorax is doing exactly what the pelvis is doing. Like if you're extending through the pelvis, you know, the pelvic outlet is closing. If you're, if the pelvis is in a position of inhalation, same thing with the thorax. If you're in a position of inhalation, now the bottom of the rib cage is closing. It's mimicking the position of the pelvis. So if you want to, if you would like to say that the infrasternal angle matches the infrapubic angle in a situation where I do not have full, ex full, um, um, respiratory excursion, you would, you would be correct in my estimation. And again, I'm hanging my ass out there to say that because I don't have a research study that shows that. But if you look at sacral position, there's only one way that the infrapubic angle can be associated with the sacral position. If you look at the infrasternal angle, um, that's a little bit easier to be represented because you can actually see it. And then um, if you look at head and neck position, and, and, and some of the, the measures there, there's another uh, AKA infrasternal angle up there that you can use to confirm your suspicions. There's another, there's another rib cage up there that you can actually use quite effectively. Are you talking about the palate or? I am not. No. What, what no. is it? I can't tell you. <laughs> Secret? <laughs> No, it's the hyoid bone. So if if it's just another narrow it's, angles, it's, it, it's a it's it's another it's another infrasternal angle. If you know what you're looking at, okay. Uh, if you look at if you look at the muscle activity that's attached to the hyoid bone, it looks just like a thorax, and it behaves just like a thorax. It widens and it narrows just like the thorax does, depending on which phase of of respiration you're in, okay. 
Um, so again, and, and again, I'm making a leap and I'm, I am, I am fully aware of the fact that I'm, I'm making a leap, but the fact that, that my interventions appear to be accurate based on my suspicions, I'm sticking to my guns until proven otherwise, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm willing to, to have anybody come back against it and, and give me more information or tell me that I'm wrong and tell me why I'm wrong. And I'm totally cool with that. But like I said, right now, it just appears to be as accurate as, as anything else I've ever done. And, and, it, and it's easier. It makes it easier. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I can appreciate that, that uh, I'm digging it. Yeah. You know, I rarely have to talk about muscles anymore. I just use what we can measure because we can't really measure muscles accurately, right? But we tend to do a pretty decent job of measuring skeletal position. Um, it's, it's inherently the only system that we do have that is relatively symmetrical that, that allows us to actually identify this stuff, right? Because you look at the internal organs, well, we kind of know that those are asymmetrical, so so that's going to screw things up. But it's representation. So when we see, you know, asymmetries in movement, we we know that the skeleton is probably somehow asymmetrical. We just need to be able to identify where that is. Well, then if we talk about where we're measuring and and how we're measuring, well, what is the and, and we're going to get into something I probably shouldn't get into. Um, we're, we're looking at, at, at a large representation of, of smaller iterative processes throughout the, the, the body. Right. So, so, uh, you know, the, so the elbow joint, just so you know, it works just like the hips, the elbow joint works just like the axial skeleton. It's exactly the same. It's just a different, representation of this of, of the same constituents if you understand the constituents that make up the axial skeleton i can show you how to treat an elbow just as easily as you do when you when you restore full respiratory excursion it's the same process it's it's not it, it we, we only have to learn how we we're manipulating the constituents of of the axial skeleton because everything else is a representation of that Okay, so we're talking about like fractal representations or iterations. I'm not really sure which way to go with that yet, but you know, you can go all the way down to to the cellular level, and you can talk about um, how proteins move inside the cell, and those are called phase transitions. And we have phase transitions in movement. So go figure. It's 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 a it's a similar process. Now everybody's mind's just like blown, or they're going like, Bill is so full of it. But anyway, Campo, I love you, it. You need to shave, Campo. You're <laughs> out of control, brother. I know. I was going to be doing it. I just miss picking on you. I, I don't get to talk to you. Right oh, now. doesn't everyone? Doesn't everyone miss it? Yeah. yeah. Like Corey's been covering his up. Corey hacked. What's going on, brother? I wanted to hear from Ty Terrell back there. Wait a minute. I want to. I want to say hi to Corey. Hi, Corey. <laughs> What's going on? Um, can I actually ask a quick question? You can ask a slow question if you like. Okay, that works too. Um, so if infrasternal angle matches infrapubic angle, and yeah. not under every circumstance, not under every circumstance, you got to be specific okay. as to when, dude. So let's if we assume it does, and uh -huh. I'm asymmetrical, mm -hmm. would that imply that the side I'm wider on would be the side that I'm oriented on? My pelvis would be oriented to. Does that make sense? I, no, it does not make sense. Um, are you are you saying that that if I see an asymmetrical infrasternal angle, that I would see the asymmetrical pelvis mirror that? Yeah. If if I am if I am limited in the f in the full excursion of respiration, I would say yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. But but on, only under those circumstances. And, and that's, that's the only circumstance that I would say that these, these rules work because when you think about it, if I, if I think about pump handle up, pump handle down, and I think about bucket handle up, bucket handle down, and I think about where the pelvis should be during respiration, they shouldn't match. 
because uh, one is representative of an inhalation position and the other is in position and in, in representative of an exhalation position. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, they should not match, but if they do, that tends to be a problem. It tends to represent a problem that appears to be measurable. Okay. Okay. So you can use kind of your other tests to confirm that. Yeah, just to a certain degree, yes. But I don't think you need a whole bunch of tests to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I mean honestly, I, I, it, like if, if you were crunched for time and you had to do, you know, a, a slam bang, you know, restoration of, of movement with someone, you could probably go with, with two tests and, and maybe even one, depending on how extreme it might be, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you just need to know, are they... Do they have full excursion or respiration? Yes, no. If no, do they have a compensatory breathing strategy? Which one is it? Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. One of the interns said they had a question. Mm. Okay. Yeah, as long as it's not about infrasternal angles, Christy. <laughs> Tim's question. We, we need to talk about something new. Okay, say so down. Infrasternal angles were so two weeks ago, dude. I mean, seriously. Come on. Okay, so talk a lot about mutation and counter-mutation. And yeah. what are the implications if you have like an excessively mutated sacrum? Is that even possible? It's a great place to rest your beer when you're slow dancing with somebody that has way too much mutation in their sacrum. It's a perfect shelf for your beer. So you, you can take it on the dance floor with you and not spill a drop. So that'd be like a state of experience. Unless you're Brian Chong, because he knows how to dance. <laughs> no, uh, so what are the implications? Yeah, so would that be like a state of extreme exhalation, you'd say? I would say so, yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're going to see a, a, a pretty significant increase in lordosis, right? Um, and then depending on, on how much of that, that anti-gravity muscle activity you've got on the backside of the body, that'll determine the orientation of the pelvis and then what kind of strategy are you using in the upper thorax. So that should be an exhaled position of the upper thorax. So you might see a really, really flat dorsal rostral area because it should be empty based on the, the sacral position. And I'm talking about above the level of the, of the false ribs. So, so the, where the true ribs are and the, the, the uh, area of the thoracic spine that they attach to, that should be flat. Okay. But you can't use a visual representation to diagnose with. It doesn't work. You have to be able to measure it. Don't trust your eyes. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Any last cues? Keaton, there's a small human walking behind you. <laughs> Hello, this is Ken. Kim Greenstein? Is this Kim Hi. Greenstein? It how is. Are how are you? Good, how are you? I am outstanding. I'm not sure if you saw a question. I just actually put it on the Facebook group earlier today oh, okay. about um, orthodontics. And I'm just curious your perspective on, um, you know, movement restrictions caused by them and, uh, Mm -hmm. Another physical therapist told me that it, it can lead to scoliosis in, in younger people. It can, um, probably. Yeah. So as, as a parent, <laughs> um, like, how do you know when your kid is ready or not ready? For what? To, to actually get them? Or, or, or any sort of retainers, because they're doing it earlier than when I was a kid. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's because you got about a bunch of mouth breathers. Um, <laughs> well, it, but seriously, so 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 they the the palate formation is dependent on tongue position, 
right? And oral motor skills and stuff like that. And so if, if I don't have a good resting tongue position up into the palate, then you're going to get some sort of asymmetry in the palate, or you're going to have um, some, some sort of uh, just default position of, of the palate that evolves. And now you've got uh, an, an upper uh, um, set of teeth that may not match the lower because the tongue's resting down in, in the bottom. So let me give you a fabulous example of what happens. Okay. So I was asthmatic from about age three months. So I breathed through my mouth almost exclusively. And so my tongue was always resting in my lower jaw. So I had, a, I actually had a class three position, but I figured out how to get my teeth over top of my my lower teeth, so they spread apart, which I, you have to make space, right, to get over top. And, and so what I'm doing is moving my face forward this way, and then we'll be able to pull my teeth back. Actually, we're going to push all my teeth together and forward and, and get everything all squared away there so I can actually breathe and all that good stuff. But um, as far as like, how do you know? Um, that's a really good question. And, and I think that um, not all orthodontists are created equal, as you would you would say that all physical therapists are not created equal based on your experience. And so you probably need to talk to somebody that understands airways. You need to talk to somebody that understands the influence of, of occlusion on, on uh, cranial position and on the cervical spine. So your, your jaw, your lower jaw, your mandible, and I can speak anatomy to you cause you've taken anatomy. So your <laughs> man, your mandible is part of your neck, but my upper teeth are part of my skull. And so if they don't match up, now I've got a neck that doesn't match my skull position. And so I, I might have to make an adjustment in my neck, right, to get my teeth together so I can chew without destroying my teeth or to have pain, right? And so, so you need to talk to somebody that, ha that understands those relationships. And unfortunately, um, that that's just questions that you need to ask. And, and if they can't answer those questions, then they're probably not the right person. And so maybe you talk to somebody, you know, in your neighborhood that, that has been through it and they say, Oh, so-and-so is very, very good or whatever. Um, Cause I don't think there's a network of orthodontists that would necessarily think that way. Um, there are some dentists, you know, like, so, so my guy is a neuromuscular dentist, although he has deviated from their direct uh, instruction and such and, and evolve some of the stuff like this thingy that I'm wearing now is, is something that, that evolved through, through his processes of, of education. Um, Cause it didn't exist before. Thankfully um, I didn't do anything crazy with my teeth. Um, but, but I think you're just going to have to do, you know, some searching um, in that regard. And, you know, if you, if you have a kid that that's had like a lot of colds or any respiratory kind of a thing, you can probably, you know, use that as a bit of a guide and say, Oh, we, maybe we have, have had an issue enough that we don't get a normal formation of the palate and we don't get a good relationship with the teeth, you know, little things like a crossbite where the teeth are kind of angled in on one side and they sort of lock the jaw in another direction can, can result in, in uh, compensatory spinal curves. Um, below that level. And so that might be what, what, you know, those, those folks are talking about. Um, and you'll see all sorts of things like that. So I don't know if that was helpful at all, but, but yeah. you're just going to have to, you know, you're going to have to seek out somebody that, that, um, you know, you can ask a couple of questions to, and, and if, again, depending on the responses and if, and if people say, Oh, well, that doesn't matter. Then you may want to just say, well, thank you very much. And then we'll go someplace else. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. All right, guys. It's, I believe it's 830 over there, right, Bill? Do we want to do one more? Does anybody have one more good question that doesn't have anything to do with infrasternal anger? <laughs> I got a quick one. Who, who said that? I did. Okay, when you say I did, I, 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 it doesn't guide me anywhere. You, Jesus. Michael Camperini. Never heard of him. Yeah, me neither. Um, what made you want to write? Start writing. What made me want to start to write? Yeah. I had a problem that needed solving, and that was the only way to solve it. There you there go. go. 
so 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 th there's 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 two questions um, that that you'll get at discharge with a patient, and um, the, one of the biggies is what do I do now? And from their perception, it is it is a very short answer, right? Like so so um, people want to know if they can continue to exercise, and then what should I do now? And, and their perspective is like, okay, um, just tell me what to do, Bill. And that's not a two minute conversation, nor is it a five minute conversation. It is a 20 chapter conversation. And so that's what I did is I tried to answer everybody's questions in one concise little volume um, that, that allows me to go get the book because that's going to answer all your questions. And then maybe we can have a conversation later on if there's anything further that you need to know. So that was basically the inspiration of the whole thing. Um, and, and I can assure you with great confidence as a published author that uh, books don't make you a lot of money. So don't make that your incentive. When, when in doubt, um, the, the, the biggest issue is, is, to, is to provide a solution to a problem. And that's why most writing should basically occur. I mean, if you read anything that is of interest to you from a business perspective or from a therapy perspective, it's about solving a problem that exists. And, and then how do I do that? So everything that we talked about tonight is basically, hey, you know what? I got this guy that walks in and he's got this problem. What do I do? Well, we measure it, we intervene, and then we remeasure and we determine, okay, was my intervention really good or did I do crappy tests and maybe I got, you know, a, a, a bad representation in my head as to what I'm doing. So it's, it's all about solving a problem. Some people will talk about it, some people will write about it, and then some people just do their thing, right? And that's how we get good. So but that's a really interesting question. Thanks for asking that. You know, if you ask, if you ask a girl that in a bar, you, maybe you got a shot next time. Appreciate the advice. No worries, man. Is there, hey, we're full service here. Always. Yeah. All right. You'll probably have to shave if you're going to stand any chance, though. Hey, in Boston, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the trend right now, man. Yeah. You're weird if you don't have one at this point. Bill, quick follow-up. Uh, do you – I'm stealing your thunder, Campo. Th thanks for the question. Do you uh, do you recommend that people write? Like, do you recommend your students write at all for sorting Always. out thoughts? Yeah. Always, absolutely. So every student that comes in has a notebook, and you 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 know this this whole process. So so every student has a notebook, and and from day one, it, it's made very clear that that notebook should be with them at all times because you, one, you can't trust your memory. Two. Um, I'll say things just off the cuff that might be meaningful to them and, and they need to be able to write these things down because one of the things that, that is, is inherent in an apprenticeship type of situation, which we don't have enough of, is that there, so there's explicit knowledge, which is the knowledge that can be written down and systematized. And so that's the stuff that you get in books or you go to a course or whatever. And, and it's, it's valuable. I don't want to devalue it, but, but the, the, the uh, implicit and the tacit knowledge that is passed on in an apprenticeship scenario cannot typically be written down or, or understood unless it's experienced. And so what they're doing then is, is they are taking what I would say or what I do or my responses and then they elaborate in their own way within their writing and then it makes sense to them and now they have something that is useful and and so yes I think everybody should write and it doesn't mean you got to post it anywhere on the internet because um, there's there's way too much fodder out there anyway um, probably including most of the stuff that I write but but point being is that um, it's just it's a great way to organize your thoughts. It's a great way to um, assure that you have an understanding. And then just from a, a, an expression standpoint, sometimes that's, that's really helpful too. And that's why, you know, people journal and, and, and get thoughts out of their head and try to make meaning of things that maybe are difficult until they become reality and, and, and you put them on paper where it is a reality. Lance, you got very dark. Yeah, I keep losing sunlight. I tried to open it. It's just not enough anymore. 
that. There we go. Okay. Anything else you want to say? I don't know. I'm I'm feeling pretty good. I uh, I really appreciated that point there. Which point um, would that be? The the writing to kind of sort out your thoughts and 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 put it into your own little model so that it's you you're not like your students aren't trying to become Bill; they're trying to become them, and you're just right, helping but, them do that. But but the thing that the the, the thing about apprenticeship is is that. Um, they don't have a way yet. Uh huh. And, and so, and, and I tell them to do this regardless of whether it's me being their clinical instructor or someone else. It's like you sell out and you, you do what that person says and you ask the hard questions and then you take their responses and then you try to make sense of them. Right. Um, and so steal anything from me that you can do anything that I do that, that seems reasonable and make sense to you because they don't have anything to work with. They don't have any clinical experience. They don't know how to talk to it to, to people or to a patient unless they've, they've had some of that, you know, in their background before. And, and so they, they, they need to have the, the ability to, to somehow um, elaborate on that information. So it can become theirs at some point in time because they, they you know, ultimately they should be better than I am. But to get them started, um, they have to, and again, it's okay for, for, for me to hear them say the exact same things that I say to a patient because that's what I do. I, what, if you go to see stand-up comedy, right, and, and you haven't seen this comedian before and he does a 30-minute a set, do you think he just like made that up today? No, he's been, doing, <laughs> he's, been doing this, he's been saying the exact same things at the exact same times, you know, for, for the last two years. And, and got really, really good at it. And so that's what the student sees me do when I'm talking to a patient. So they have to take that information and then, but they have to elaborate and, and then try to make it their own. The reference that I always use is the movie Finding Forrester, um, which is a, a, actually a great little movie. But um, there's a scene where this kid wants to be a writer and Sean Connery plays this, this uh, reclusive writer that ha- nobody's heard from in years. And, and so this guy finds him and, and he, and, he, and he finally convinces Sean to help him learn how to be a writer. And so he sits the kid down at a desk. He puts a typewriter in front of him and he goes, write. And that was his advice, right? And the kid's <laughs> going like, well, wait a minute, what do I write? He goes, whatever comes to mind, just start writing. And, and the kid just sits <laughs> there and he has no idea what to do. And so what Sean does is he hands him an old essay that he wrote you know, years and years and years ago. So he hands the kid the essay and he goes, start typing my words. And then when you start to feel your own words take over, go ahead and just follow that. And that's literally what this kid does. And he writes this amazing thing and it gets caught for plagiarism. But anyway, <laughs> point being is you, you, you just have to, you have to have a model to go off of. And, and, and that's where, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of apprenticeship and, and this intern stuff. And that's why we take a student every, every semester is because I just think it's important because they just, people just need a guide. They need someplace to start. And if I can help somebody do that, then, then, you know, more power to them. Um, you know, and if you need a book that, that is associated with this type of thing, then read the book mastery by Robert Greene. Um, it is entirely about this, this whole relationship and how things work. And there's great stories about, Ben Franklin and, and, and that got me excited about reading Ben Franklin's biography and so on and so forth. But, but, but anyway, that's a really, really good book to read for every student or any person that is a a learner and, and wants to learn from someone else. And I hope my interns heard that. Okay, good. They're shaking their heads. I, I love that book. I recently read it and then I went through it again and they took all my notes and everything. That one, hit me at just the right time. I know I'm just a talking silhouette right now, but (laughs) Uh, I was going to say another one. um, I don't remember what it's called, but uh, Stephen Pressfield has been writing for the longest time, all sorts of different ads. And I think he wrote uh, erotic videos as well. And he, he wrote some things that actually did well. And it took about 40 years. And he just said, everything you write is going to suck. So keep writing until so it, wait, it doesn't. I think is it somebody help me out here. Does anybody know the Hemingway quote about the first draft? Does anybody know that? Like anybody? is that the 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 first is for you? 
No, I, well, I, um, I thought it was something in reference to like the first draft is always shit. Oh. <laughs> but maybe maybe it is the first draft for you. <laughs> I just misinterpreted it as I wrote it down. <laughs> there was a lot about your self worth. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can assure you that 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 you know the the draft that I have up on Amazon.com right now um, it is um, it is version N. So it started with version A. <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah, that's how many iterations of that that thing came. Yeah, to, before I got something that I could even post up there. That that was that was. A long time. Is is that a real count? It was N number it of N. times. It is N. It is N right now. It is. It is. It is. Yeah. A whatever the letter N is. What number? Does somebody know off the top of their head? I know the E is five, and that's ten, twelve ish. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. And 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 let me just yeah. the, the the model for all the photos is actually on this call, so this is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Wave to us, Brian Chung. <laughs> Brian Chung. Brian Chung. Yeah. Uh, MS, MD, PhD, plastic surgeon, dance instructor, international dance instructor, um, and fitness model. Mm. Oh, tequila expert. Dude, if you were my type, I'd marry you. You're, you're so skilled. <laughs> You're just not my type. I don't like Asians. <laughs> <laughs> I, meant, I meant to say Canadians. I meant Canadians. <laughs> All right, kids. We love you, Brian. I had a good time. So let me get like a, a 30 second question. Go. Ready? Speed round. What's your favorite color? My favorite what? Color. Black. Easy to match. I can't match clothing, so so I wear black. <laughs> well, you laugh. Always, always going to a funeral. Well, let's not go there. I, I'm not going to go there. No, that's why we wear black at iFast. Seriously, because it's like I had no idea how to match colors. It's like let's just go black. Mike goes, oh, "That's a good idea." <laughs> or you just don't have faith in interns to match either. Well. And they're they're a little mismatched as it as it goes. So. I, Lance, I think we're in the part that we edit out. <laughs> we don't do that anymore, Bill. You know that. Oh, seriously? <laughs> okay. I didn't curse this. I did curse, didn't I? You did a little bit, I but I think people will see you as more human that way instead of just this. See, I don't. This I don't, reading, don't. regurgitating monster of a brain. Mm. <laughs> All right. Bill, thanks as always. See you next month. Appreciate it. Guys, thanks for coming. See you all next month. Interns, get back to work. You should be cleaning something. <laughs> the, uh, I, I have some, some sparing notes, and we're going to put them up, and you can watch this video on YouTube. All right. Bye.